see. So it's sort of just sinking in. Um, so I am originally from New York. Um, I grew up in Queens, um, went to high school in Brooklyn, and then went to Stanford for college. So all the way across the country. Um, I went to University of Michigan for medical school, um, did a master's during medical school in Boston, and then now I'm back to New York. So I always joke because um, when I went across the country for college, my parents were very upset <laughs> and I promised them that I was gonna come back eventually. Um, and it took like 10 years, but I am back now. <laughs> um, so I did my dermatology residency at NYU. So right here in New York City. And now I am doing a fellowship in cosmetics and lasers, um, also in New York, um, at a practice called Union Square Laser Dermatology. Um, I just started this month and it's been awesome so far. Um, so I, I'll just go backwards. One of the reasons why I decided to go to, into medicine um, was because for me it was I think it, out of all the things that I explored when I was in college, um, it was one of the most impactful fields in my opinion. Um, I think just being able to improve the health of patients, um, it was just really meaningful to me. In addition, I think it was also one of the most interesting to me, academically speaking. I've always liked science. Um, I went to a school in New York called Brooklyn Tech for high school. And even though we were in high school, we had like mini majors and my major was biomedical science. So I've always sort of been a little bit of a science nerd. So that part kind of clicked for me as well. Uh, that being said, I will say that I did not immediately go into medicine. So I was not, uh, your classic pre-med student because when I got to college I wanted to just kind of like take a minute and explore other things. Um, I knew a lot of people who were doctors and one of the advice some actually a piece of the advice that they were giving me was just make sure you don't like just jump into it make sure you think it through consider other options and so for me I, I did consider other options. I was still a bio major but I thought about for a while doing like public health related things. And I still am interested in public health. Um, I thought about doing, you know, um, international health, like sort of like working for a large NGO um, and helping them from like a business perspective or organizational perspective. So I really did kind of think through all the things um, out there that have, were involved in healthcare that were not necessarily medicine per se, um, but eventually ended up deciding that medicine was for me. Um, so for me, that meant since I didn't graduate with all of my pre-med requirements because I wasn't pre-med, it, mean, it meant that I had to do a post-bac program. Um, so I did a one-year post-bac at a facility called Bryn Mawr, uh, which is out in Pennsylvania. And it was essentially doing all of your pre-med requirements in an expedited fashion. It was really, really intense, but it was really good, I think, because there was like a very big um, collegial group environment. And, uh, you know, you just kind of get it over with and you do it and then you take the MCAT. And so it was a very difficult year, but I, I don't think I would have wanted to do it any other way. Um, there are some options, if that sounds too intense for you, there are other options where you can sort of do it in a longer period of time. Like some people will do a post back for two years. Other people will, you know, work part-time, do classes in the evening. So you can do it, take as long as you need. Um, but for me, I know I just kind of wanted to do it quickly. <laughs> so from there, I did the postdoc requirements and then I went straight to Michigan um, for medical school, which was awesome as well. Um, and I'll just pause there because I don't want to, you know, talk too much and I want to make sure that this is relevant and <laughs> in line with what people are wanting to hear. Um, but I can also talk about why I decided dermatology in particular, if that would be helpful. Yeah, that would be amazing if you could just talk to us about, you know, what experiences you had that led you to make, you know, this, uh, choose dermatology. Yeah, so in medical school, you know, there are like sort of core areas and a lot of that will be medicine, surgery, pediatrics, etc. And if you're interested in more of a um, specialized field, you may not necessarily be exposed to it right away. So for me, I wasn't as exposed to dermatology as much until towards the end of my medical school career. But I was always somewhat interested in it in the sense that I've always liked the skin, <laughs> I've always liked skincare. Um, and one of the reasons why it attracted me from a, a physician perspective is because it's one of the few fields of medicine where if you have something wrong with you from a dermatologic perspective, 
not only does it bother you and not only are you aware of it, but usually everyone else is too. Like if it's in a visible place, if it's a rash or if it's acne or if it's, you know, rosacea, vitiligo, et cetera. And I think that adds a whole nother dynamic to it because you have not just the medical aspect, but often like a psychological aspect too. Um, and I'd say psychosocial to be more specific. You know, we see a lot of conditions where it's really important to treat and get things under control because it's affecting the patient's ability to, you know, just be out into the world and to feel comfortable with themselves, which is unfortunate, but as a dermatologist, if you can fix it or at least improve it, you're not only helping them medically, but you're often really like impacting their life from a social perspective and often a psychological one too. So that's one of the reasons why I loved it. The other thing I really liked about dermatology was um, the age groups that you can see and the people that you can see. So, you know, I can see, and I do see um, everything from kids, you can uh, to see older people, adults, and then you can see elderly people because everyone has some sort <laughs> of a rash. Um, you can focus on teenagers, obviously, because acne is a huge issue along with other things. You can see women, you can see men. So I just liked the fact that there was a huge variety. And then the third thing I would say is it had the perfect blend for me of like primary care, you know, seeing patients regularly, whether that's being like an annual skin check or like an acne follow-up, but also hands-on. So one of the reasons why I'm doing fellowship is because I love the hands-on part. I love treating things with lasers. I love doing cosmetics and, you know, injecting things because it has a very, um, immediate gratifying effect to it. And I like to see results. Um, and then I just like working with my hands and sort of like doing tactically. And there's also surgery and dermatology too. So derm for me was the perfect blend of like being able to follow a patient long-term, you know, see them throughout their issues or throughout life, if it's with respect to skin checks, but also if they have an issue, let's say they have a cyst, you can take it out, you can close it and then they can see you for follow-up and then it's done. It's like you fixed it. And I, I liked that aspect of it too. So that, those are, I think, were the three biggest reasons why I wanted to do dermatology. Um, I will say, and this, this is much later on down the line for you guys, but derm is a competitive field. Um, so for a lot of people who are interested in it, uh, research is often recommended, which I think can, can be a little bit intimidating for people, but it's actually good because I think it helps you get to know the fields a little bit better and to decide if that's what you want to do. Um, sometimes in medical school, I think people feel rushed to make a decision and don't uh, often have a chance to really like spend enough time. If, let's say, unfortunately, if you don't know a dermatologist or whatever field you're interested in, so you don't have enough exposure to it before you get to make that decision. Um, I think research is one of the ways that can help give you that extra exposure, <laughs> so to speak. Um, and then I would just say a typical dermatologist day can vary depending on what you're seeing, but you can do everything from skin checks. So you will have like your patients, let's say they have a history of skin cancer, whether it's melanoma and you're seeing them regularly just to look them over and make sure that they aren't having any recurrence. Um, and that's important, especially for people who have things on their backs or in places where they can't necessarily monitor it. Um, and that's one of the areas where you're really going to save someone's life. You know, melanoma is one of those diseases where if caught early can have really great outcomes. And so you have an opportunity to really extend the life period of someone by helping them detect um, melanoma in its early stages. Then you go from that to, you can see acne, as I mentioned. So you can see a lot of young acne visits. And at those visits, you might prescribe medications. You might do chemical peels. You might do other procedures. Um, you might just check in on them, see how they're doing, see what new um, creams they're using, see basically their progress. Um, you could do surgeries. You can have, like I mentioned before, you can have a cyst. You can remove skin cancers. You can do lasers. So if someone has um, red spots on their face or even just like dispigmentation, there's a lot of lasers that we use to treat that, which is, it's just really fulfilling. Actually, it's a, one of the gratifying things for me is to zap something and watch it go away. Um, you can also do laser hair removal, um, which is, can be really life-changing for people too, to not have to shave after a while. So that's also um, a gratifying thing. And, you know, everything, 
after that in between. And as I said, you can see all age ranges, all types of people and do as much as you want with your hands if you want that kind of practice. For some people who don't like surgery as much, they can make it more skin check. So more acne follow-ups. And if you love surgery, dermatology has a focus called um, Mo surgery. And then there's also people who just do, you know, excisions um, and things like that. And you can do a lot of it. So I like that you can really mold it into your own like personalized uh, blend of patient populations uh, based on what you like to do the best. Um, as you were saying, uh, dermatology is a really competitive field. How do you kind of avoid like burnout and just like having a really good work-life balance? Yeah, so Derm, I would say is one of the, is one of the better fields of medicine with respect to work-life balance in the sense that there are dermatology emergencies. However, they're not as plentiful <laughs> as in some specialties. So, you know, oftentimes as a full-time dermatologist, you're not often working as much on the weekend, unless you're on call and then you'll, you know, you'll go see patients, but you're not going to be like working every weekend um, unless you want it to. So it, it's nice that you can kind of have a boundary with respect to your week. Um, and, you know, there might be some calls after hours, but I would say compared to, um, you know, working in the ED, for example, or, you know, as even as a family physician, sometimes I think, I think we do pretty well with respect to work-life balance. Um, I do think though that it can be a challenge during residency and then on the path just to becoming a dermatologist to balance things. Um, residency can be tough in, across all specialties, mostly because you're training, you're learning so much, you're working with all these doctors called attending doctors who are in charge of training you, but, you know, may also be asking you challenging questions that you kind of really get pushed to your, your um, academic potential. Um, and then on top of that, you're seeing patients all the time. And uh, usually that's a good thing, but sometimes patients can have their challenges too. And, you know, you might have someone who has a bad day or they get a result they don't like, and then they kind of take it out on you. Meanwhile, you aren't having the best day either, <laughs> but you kind of have to just suppress it. Um, so I think within resident, across all residencies, not even specific to dermatology, I think, um, Work-life balance can be a challenge during residency. You know, there are issues with respect to wellness. Um, I think some residency programs have been really trying to target that in particular. I know my residency program, we would have a wellness day um, every couple months just to, you know, do something for ourselves and remind ourselves to take care of ourselves, which is a good habit to form. Even as pre-med students, I think it's a good habit to form to, to form early because amongst young people, you know, the rates of anxiety and depression are going up every year. And I think that um, people in medicine are particularly susceptible to those kind of issues. So it's important to understand how you can decompress and what sort of activities you can use to help lift your own mood, whether that be exercise, which for me, sometimes it is, I, I love to walk on the treadmill. Um, that could be playing with your dog, that could be, you know, playing online, watching TV, but you have to sort of remember what it is that makes you happy and what it is that can help relieve stress because later on in life, you, you may have those really stressful periods, especially during residency. And it will be important to kind of go back to that to really build those coping mechanisms. Um, I have another question. So yeah. have you ever felt or like faced any like obstacles as a woman in medicine or a woman of color in medicine? Ooh, that's a that's a great question. Um, yes, I would say that you know I've had the opportunity to practice um, or to be trained, I should say, in different parts of the country, um, and I think that I've been pretty lucky overall that this has not been a regular thing or hasn't even been something that has happened you know repeatedly. But there have been, I would say, one or two incidents um, where patients. Once, what one time in particular, I remember they didn't necessarily believe that I was a physician. Um, and I remember a patient asking to see my ID um, when I was consulted to go and see a to go and see someone in the ED. And then they were like, "Oh, you can't be the doctor. Can I see your badge?" And then of course they kind of like walked it back, and they were like, "Oh, you know, we just have to be sure and security." Um, so that was disappointing. Obviously, um, I think that. 
as a woman and, you know, as a woman of color, um, there are definitely times where you have sort of like an imposter syndrome because you may not be surrounded by people who look like you. And so you're trying to like make sure that you fit in and then for someone to sort of doubt your abilities just because of how you look can be very disappointing and can be very, um, can be harmful to your, to you as a person and then overall your like confidence and your self-esteem. But I think that for me in that, I'll talk about that specific <laughs> situation. It definitely took me a second and I had to sort of, you know, come back to myself. And then I just said to myself that I'm just going to do the best that I can. And I'm just going to see this patient and I'm going to put that aside for now. And I just, you know, saw the consult, answered all of his questions. And literally by the end of the encounter, the guy was like prolifically apologetic because he was like, oh, no one's ever really talked to me like this before. No one's really sat down and explained things to me. So I think it, it was a, probably a teaching moment for him too. Um, and then when I was done with that visit and I went home and like talked to my friends, that's when I was able to sort of use that as an outlet and talk about how it made me feel. And I think that was one of, that is one of the things that I, I would um, advise is when you are in those situations, you always want to be professional. You always want to do your job to the best of your ability and to how you are trained. And you always want to treat the patient with 100% you know, respect, even if that's not necessarily what you got. When you're done with that, I do think it's important not to suppress how it made you feel. Because um, I think sometimes you know, we build up this wall is like exterior where we're unfazed and like nothing is going to make us you know <laughs> you want to like be this tough person but if something like that happens and, and it hurts your feelings or it makes you feel a certain type of way I do think it's important to talk to somebody about it and so for me it was like talking to my peers about it and just kind of like using that as an outlet and as, as an opportunity um, just to get that out there because I think sometimes or I've seen it sometimes in other people where if they don't discuss it and it kind of builds up and then it starts to affect them later on. Um, I think that can be damaging too. Um, so I would say it's, it's stay the course, be professional, be nice. And then when you go home, just make sure that you release it and you get it out and, you know, discuss it and express yourself. <laughs> yeah, that sounded uh, really awful <laughs> uh, that happened. Yeah. Um, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to put it in the chat. You can see the chat, right? Um, oh, yeah. I guess okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you have any, like, interesting cases that you would be able to share with us? I do. Let me see if I have, oh, I do have sharing screen abilities, right? Okay, yeah. awesome. I have a PowerPoint. Um, and remind me, so the audience, for the most part, is pre-health, sort of like high school, yeah, high school and college. High school and college. Okay, all right. So I think this would be appropriate. Um, so it's a lot of slides, but I'm not going to do all of them. I'm just going to click through because I think it would be nice. Let me see. Tell me if you can see the whole screen. Yeah, I can see. Okay, great. So I'm just going to show some pictures. And um, I think a lot of people are muted, but you can type or you can just speak out loud if you'd like to. Um, and just answer the question. Okay, so what do you think this is? Any thoughts? It's not a trick question. <laughs> is it acne? Perfect, yes, <laughs> this is acne. Okay, so I'll get a click here. Okay, so I, I'm not gonna read through the whole thing, but just to let you know that it, it does come from the follicles and there it's multifactorial. So a lot of the treatments that we use are addressing those factors. And of course we always think of it with teenagers, but it actually happens in young adults too. And I even have like adults, adults with acne. So um, you can see it in all age ranges. There are some external things that can contribute to it, whether it's like things that you're putting on your face or your hair, you know, stress, diet is a little bit tricky because the studies are always evolving on that, but other things um, like occlusive clothing, environment, psychological are more straightforward and are not really as up for debate. And as we know, we can get it on our face, our neck, our chest. Um, and then the thing that I think a lot of people don't necessarily discuss enough is that Yes, you get the acne, but a lot of times the longer term consequences, which can happen, especially if you're like 
picking at them or scratching them, so like scarring and hyperpigmentation, that can be very, very difficult to treat. So we always emphasize to patients, like if you get acne, go see a doctor or just, you know, treat it and wait for it to go away. But please, please, please don't pick at it. I'm always saying that like 10 times a day. Um, <laughs> this is a classification. I'm not going to go through that. Just, just wanted to let you know. And then these are just a bunch of different treatment options that we use for acne. Some of these are probably somewhat familiar <laughs> just because as people, I'm sure everyone here has had a, a pimple of once, once or twice in their life. Um, but as you get to more severe levels of acne, we do oral medications too. So whether that's like pills or contraceptives, um, antibiotics, et cetera. So we have a lot of things in our arsenal that we can use to treat acne depending on how severe it is. Okay, here's a, maybe a slightly trickier one, but if anyone has any thoughts on what this might be, um, I'll give you a hint. Aside from the skin, there are hints in the photo that might be kind of like pointing to <laughs> what could be going on. Is it sunburn? Oh, that's such a good guess. So it actually sunburn is not wrong because the sun, if you get a sunburn, it can make this particular entity worse. Um, and that entity is allergic contact dermatitis. Um, so basically it's when you get exposed to something, either you're allergic to it or you're irritated by it. Um, and it induces this response to the skin. So going back to this photo, the hint that I was mentioning in this photo on the, on the top right, the nickel in the belt buckle is a classic one. Someone might be allergic to nickel and they get this rash kind of like right next to their belly button and they don't know where it's coming from. Um, and then they go see us and then we're like, let me see your belt. <laughs> and then you can see right there. Um, and then this one on the bottom left is from the earring. So one of the hints for us as uh, dermatologists is if you kind of see what's in that area, if it's always consistent, if you're always getting this rash in that same spot and there's something else in that spot that kind of tells you what it is or kind of gives you a hint, I should say. Um, so nickel is one of them, sometimes with clothing or nail polish, formaldehyde, fragrances is another, you know, preservatives, rubber. Um, people can be sensitive to all sorts of, all sorts of things. Treatment, of course, you're gonna wanna avoid it. So if you're wearing a nickel belt, unfortunately, you're gonna have to give that belt to somebody else. Um, but in addition to that, we can also treat the redness with corticosteroids and we can cool the skin with uh, calamine lotion, things like that. Okay, the next one. Any thoughts here? So this is a knee, this is an elbow, and I think this is a back. <laughs> um, and you can see it's like well demarcated. Some would say scaly, um, salmon colored sometimes is a word that's used. Um, we have a message in the chat. Oh. Oh, perfect. So when I'm on the screen share, I can't see the chat anymore. So thank you for letting me know. Um, and then you could just read it if anything else comes up. Psoriasis is correct. Excellent job, um, whoever <laughs> wrote that message. So um, psoriasis is one of the most common um, diagnoses that we see in clinic. Oftentimes it's like plaques with a silver scale. It's a immune related with T lymphocytes in the skin, which we won't go into, but just know that there's different types. There's that plaque psoriasis, which is probably the most classic type. And that's the one that was in the photo, but you can also have something called guttate psoriasis, which are like much, much, much smaller dots. Um, there's postular psoriasis, which can look scary when you see it. It's more severe because there's like superficial pustules and things. Um, and then there's inverse psoriasis, which happens like in the folds. And then there's also nail psoriasis, which a lot of people don't know, um, but that can be associated with something called pitting. So I'll just show you some of the pictures here. So this is gut tape. It's more like little small coin size. Inverse happens like in the axilla or sometimes in the groin area too, postular sars pustules and then nail psoriasis here. You can see that too. Okay. And it's a disease that's going to be kind of chronic. Um, so depending on how severe it is, we can do topicals, we can do orals, and then now we can even do injectables. You've probably seen a bunch of commercials for things like, you know, Humira, Taltz, Cosentix, et cetera. Um, so a lot of times we do prescribe those sort of medications. Um, here's a treatment. So essentially what I just said. <laughs> All right, next one. I think you guys know this one. Let me know if somebody types it. So you have these depigmented patches on the hands and you can see it on the chest too. I think Michael Jackson may have had this. Is it a uh, vitiligo? Vitiligo, vitiligo, excellent. Oh wait, I just figured out how to pull up a chat. 
Okay, great job on psoriasis, H. Tune, <laughs> and then Stephanie and H. Tune, great job with vitiligo. Okay, great. So vitiligo is uh, skin depigmentation. You know, it's it's not 100% known what causes it, but it's thought to have some sort of influence with genetics. Um, and then the pathogenesis involves melanocytes. Uh, it is slowly progressive, but we do have great treatments for this as well. I'm just skipping through very quickly so we can um, get through this, but you can do topicals for this as well. You can do surgery and then they even have like deep pigmentation therapies. Okay. And then this is the next one. This one's a little bit harder. So this one you might see in like the, um, um, let's say hypothetically the emergency room. Um, let's say, so this is on the, I think elbow. And then this is on the girl's face. Let's say the area was red and like kind of hot and warm um, and it's in the infectious category. This is a tough one. So I won't belabor and stress you guys out too much. This one is cellulitis. So it's an infection of the skin and sometimes can extend deeper than that. Um, and then there's things that can make it more likely. So if you have lymphedema, if there's like a particular entry point, so like, let's say you have an ulcer um, or some sort of like wound, if you suffer from venous insufficiency, which is when the legs kind of like swell up because the veins are not um, functioning as well, your legs are have edematous, or you can just be overweight. These are sort of things that can be Identify. And so in addition to the rash, you might have fever, chills, myalgias, you can have white count. These are just some of the findings here. And then these are more specific information. And the treatment sort of depends on what the um, pathogen is, but it's going to be antibiotics. And then which antibiotic you use depends on, you know, if it's strep, if it's staph, et cetera. Okay, almost done. This one is also a little bit tricky, but it actually happens quite often in, in, in your age group <laughs> as well as my age group, but you might see a, a depigmented rash or sometimes it can be dark. Someone asked, cellulitis is infectious. Yes, correct. Cellulitis is infectious. Well, infectious in the sense that it's in, caused by an infection. Yes, it is. Okay, so this one is tinea versicolor. Um, this is caused by a yeast called Pitosporum. Um, it is actually seen in all skin. It's like a normal skin yeast that's present, but in some people, for some reason, it's just a little bit more prevalent and thus can lead to this like hypopigmented um, or light brown macules and that can be a little bit scaly too. The treatment um, is usually topical antifungals. Occasionally, if it's very, very extensive, we might do orals as well, such as like fluconazole because we don't use ketoconazole orally as well. So that, that slide is outdated. Um, and then I think this is maybe the last one, but what do you guys think these are? Very common, a lot of kids have them. Actually adults have them too, but you might see them a lot in like kids' hands. It's kind of like super scaly. It can be on the hands, feet, any thoughts? Okay, so those are cutaneous warts. Um, it can, is it caused by HPV? As I said, most commonly in children and in young adults. Um, there are certain predisposition conditions that can make it more likely, but very, 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 very common. Um, and that they have an incubation period as well. So the diagnosis is clinical. Often in clinic, what we'll do is we'll scrape off the super scaly part to show like the little vessels underneath, and then we'll, we'll treat that. Um, and this just talks about the treatment. So you can do salicylic acid, you can do liquid nitrogen, um, something called cantharidin. You can do cryotherapy, which is a really uh, cold um, spray, uh, curatage, and then there's other interlesional things that you can do. Oh, this is the last one. Okay, so this is a person, let's say it's an older person, and then they have just a like strip kind of going through, going across a certain uh, landmark. I'm trying not to use very <laughs> dermatologic terms so that it makes sense for you guys. Um, but they'll say this, this is a dermatome. So you see how it's kind of like in a line in this one particular area on the body. Has anyone ever heard of the term called shingles before? Okay, yeah, so this is essentially that. So this is called herpes zoster is the um, medical term that we use. And it's a reactivation of chickenpox. So you'll get chickenpox when you're a kid and then it basically like hides out in your body. And then for some people when they, especially when they become older, like elderly, that chickenpox infection can reactivate 
and that was what is often deemed as, as shingles. Um, in addition, you'll probably have like fever, pain, headache, and then you'll get those vesicles. There's that word dermatomal that I mentioned for several days as well. So this you want to get treated. Um, so we'll usually do something like acyclovir, also known as Valtrex, or excuse me, valcyclovir, also known as Valtrex, um, or you can do acyclovir, famcyclovir, and then occasionally might be doing it with steroids too. I think this is the last one, I promise. So this is a pre-cancer called actinic keratosis. And then I just wanted to show the picture of the other one. So these are basal cell cancers, which we see a lot. Um, they're small, shiny, and they grow slowly. It's the most common form of skin cancer that we see. This is a squamous cell or squamous cell, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Um, skin cancer is another form often seen in particularly elderly patients. And then finally, this is obviously our biggest fear as dermatologists is melanoma. Um, it is the one that can, it can come either from a pre-existing mole or you can actually get a new mole um, and it can appear anywhere. And so this is one of the things that we're often looking for when we do skin checks. Okay, great. These are <laughs> the references. And then special thanks to, um, there is a woman who actually put this together for um, her internal medicine cohort that I was able to grab this from. So I would thank her for that. Okay, I know that was a big whirlwind, but I just wanted to give you a, a flavor <laughs> of some of the things that we see in dermatology. Um, and you can see just based on those pictures, how wide of a range it is. And because of that, how well we have to be trained because <laughs> there's pretty much anything skin-wise that can walk in through the door. All right, any questions on any of those? Oh, so um, I have trouble remembering skin, condition, skin conditions and their microbiology. What is your advice? Um, you mean from like an academic perspective or more so just like personal interest perspective? Or, okay, so let's say if it's academic or actually even personal interest, my advice, oh, I'd say both. Okay, so the AAD, which is the American Academy of Dermatology, has a free um, basic derm modules on their website that anybody can access. You might have to create an account, but you don't have to pay for it. Um, and it's a nice way to get like uh, just intro to the skin. Um, and then it go, it has certain modules, like it has acne, it has, you know, melanoma, it has like infections. Um, so you can kind of look at things by category and they have, I know they have cases and they have like pictures that you can flip through. So for someone starting at a baseline of not having much of a background, I think those are great. I did those when I were, when I was a medical student and I found them really helpful. So that's what I would recommend. Okay. Um, I have one last question. Yes. Um, have, like, has there been like times where you didn't really know um, I guess, or you needed help like diagnosing someone and like, what would you do if you were in that moment? Yeah. I mean, that happens all the time. I think even, even I, I my mentors tell me that you're always going to you know, come across challenging patients. So I think one of the things is to make sure, first of all, that you don't panic. <laughs> and then second of all, use your resources, right? So those can come in two forms. Oh, you're welcome. H -tune. You're very welcome. Um, so that can be your resources as in people. So, you know, whether that's your co-residents or like an attending that you work with, someone that you can, you know, call or text um, and discuss a case with offline. Um, the second thing I would say is your medical, like more textbook resources. Never be afraid to go back to the textbook and just to refresh yourself, especially if it's something that you haven't seen in a while. Um, and then that way you can, you know, formulate your ideas before you have to make a decision. So for me, if, if and when that happens, I will basically tell the patient, you know, I want to think about this a little bit. So why don't we just, you know, do X, Y, Z for now as a temporary measure. I'll see you back in a day or two. And then when you have time at the end of the day, you call someone or you look it up, but you just want to make sure that you're giving the best care. And often that means taking a minute to just think it through if it's something that doesn't automatically come to mind. Okay, great. Um, I don't think anyone else has any questions. So thank you so much for coming um, and presenting to us. Um, yeah, just thank you so much. Yeah, you're very, very welcome. It was so nice talking to you guys. Um, I'm, I hope 
if you decide to do medicine, you really go for it. It's a long road, but I think it can be really worth it in the end, especially if you do something that you love. Oh, you're welcome. Um, and yeah, you can, nice meeting you all. And if you have any questions, feel free to uh, contact me at any time. Great. Have a great day. You're welcome. Bye.